the right to self-determination and the Soviet roots of the current war. Why do we support self-determination? From a socialist standpoint, we should support it because, firstly, in a capitalist economy, where self-determination is denied, then politics becomes dominated by nationalism, and socialist politics effectively becomes impossible or very hard to develop. So we support it in order to remove an obstacle to the future development of socialist politics. Then, historically, in colonial countries, independence was the route to developing a modern industrial society, particularly where independence was part of a movement led by socialists, as was the case in Vietnam. Historically, it was posed in terms of the right of nations to self-determination, and the nations in question being people like the Czechs or the Greeks, who were denied self-determination initially by the Turkish or um, Austrian empires, etc. And when the Second International discussed the question, and you read texts of the period, they're talking about self-determination in the European empires of places like um, Austro-Hungary, Russia or Turkey. From the mid-20th century, the issue of self-determination became relevant in the context of colonial territories in Africa. And these didn't easily match up to the 19th century European concept of a nation, since they didn't always have a, a single common language, for example. Instead, these were administrative units of larger European empires. But the fact they didn't match the classical concept of a, a nation, according to um, Second International terms, doesn't mean that they didn't have the right to self-determination. Third context is when territories are of disputed loyalty or disputed claims between two states. Uh, examples are like Saarland or Alsace-Lorraine between France and Germany, Northern Ireland between the UK and the Irish Republic, Kashmir between India and Pakistan, Crimea between Ukraine and Russia. In these cases, it's also necessary to focus on the actual territory and the people who live in it. Since claims about nationhood and whether this territory is a nation or not are highly contentious and disputed by one side or the other, and they're not su subject, susceptible to any kind of objective determination. Now, we want these things to be solved quite peacefully. We want national and territorial questions to be resolved without civil or international war. And the basis for a peaceful resolution has to be a vote of the people in the territory seeking self-determination. And a vote can either be to separate, for instance, as happened with Czechia or Catalonia, or it can become, be a vote to become part of another state, for instance, Kashmir, might vote to become part of Pakistan. There have been examples in the past of this working. In 1955, the disputed territory of the Tsarland between France and Germany, which at that time was a French protectorate, was given the option of becoming an independent state within the European Economic Community, or the Common Market as it then was, and or alternatively becoming part of Germany, and they voted to become part of Germany. And that was accepted by France. The 1998 Good Friday Agreement between the um, British and Irish governments initially, and then endorsed by the population of the north and south of Ireland, uh, brought an end to the civil war there by recognising that the future status of Northern Ireland could be... A, altered at any or at some point in the future by a democratic vote. Another example of a peaceful separation or peaceful self-determination is the separation of the Czech and Slovak republics from Czechoslovakia. Now that was done by a vote, votes in the respective parliaments, not by a referendum, so it's not as democratic as if you had a referendum, but it's, it was peaceful anyway. Now look at the Soviet case. 
the right to self-determination was built into the Soviet constitution. And in March 1991, there was a referendum on this. In, questions were asked, in the votes were held in the republics to say, do you want to remain part of the USSR, basically? And all the republics which had the referendum, or in which it took place, all voted by a huge majority that they wanted to stay in the USSR and wanted the USSR to persist. Certain republics, particularly the Baltics, uh, Georgia and Armenia, refused to participate in that and held their own votes for independence before that. The, the percentages for um, independence were rather ludicrous. I mean, they were sort of in the high 90%. 98, 99%. So one may have questions about uh, how realistic those votes were, given that the votes held in the rest of the USSR, including Russia and Ukraine, showed 70% for staying in the USSR. Now, if you've got 70% saying, 30% saying no, and opinion polls say 70%, then it's probably a genuine vote. The breakup of the USSR did not come through the provision for self-determination in its constitution. It came instead by a unilateral act by the presidents of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the USSR in, the, in December of um, 1991. So... It wasn't by any vote. It was just a presidential decree. Now that left certain territories in, a, in limbo. Most prominently Crimea, which from 1921 until the Second World War had been an autonomous Soviet Republic, i.e. in the same status as Russia or Ukraine. In 1945, it was incorporated as a, an oblast or a region of the Soviet Republic. Before the vote on whether the USSR should dissolve or be pre preserved was held, there was a referendum in Crimea which voted to re-establish it as an autonomous Soviet Republic. Because it had been initially in, uh, I missed out, the 954, it was transferred to be part, an oblast of the Ukrainian Republic. But these were just territorial adjustments within the USSR. But nevertheless, in 1991, they decided they wanted to be a republic of their own. After the Ukrainian president took Ukraine out of the USSR, the Crimean the following year, the Crimean Parliament declared they were an independent country, the Republic of Crimea, in 1992. However, the Ukrainian state suppressed the, the constitution of the Crimean Republic, dissolved the constitution and took control and incorporated it um, as an integral part of the Ukrainian state in 1995. The importance of this is that it indicates that Crimea had a long history of self-determination prior to the current crisis. Current crisis occurred after 2014 when there was a coup in Kiev where President Yanuk Yanukovych who had got in on the votes basically of the eastern and southern part of the uh, Ukraine was overthrown by mass demonstrations in Kiev, an area which hadn't voted for him. Um, immediately after that, the Crimean Parliament again de declared their autonomy and held a vote on whether to become part of Russia, which on 80% um, said it would. Uh, opinion polls indicate that was re a realistic data. Now, we know that restoration of its control over Crimea has been a, a key Ukrainian war aim. But on the in all the available evidence, the Crimeans don't want to rejoin Ukraine. So supporting that is a no-no. Uh, 
If the Crimean vote to leave the Ukraine was illegitimate, then Ukraine's own secession from the USSR would have been doubly illegitimate because it was completely unconstitutional. It was just a, a presidential decree. Um, so the Crimea has as much right to d choose to be part of Russia as Ukraine has to choose to be an independent state. Of course, you can't look at this just within the context of the local politics. Ukraine supported by NATO in this, supported by the US, and they have clear great power motivations for that. They want to deprive the Russians of their fleet base in Sevastopol and ideally they would like to turn it into an American base. And it's, there's little doubt the whole thing would have been settled peacefully were it not for the guarantee of support that the US has given Ukraine. Now, how should a peaceful settlement take place? Oh, how could a peaceful settlement take place? I'm not saying it's likely. I'm saying what in principle would be a peaceful settlement? Well, it have to be one based on self-determination. It has to be one based on the democratic will of the people of the territories. Now, the Ukrainians object to the referendum in Crimea, saying it was held under Russian supervision. Well, let there be a referendum held under genuinely neutral supervision. Let the African Union come in and hold a referendum in Crimea and any of the other disputed territories to see which country they want to be part of. I say the, the African Union because you can't count on any European organisation to be neutral in this. Um, and also, of course, Europe drew up boundaries in Africa, so it's Africa's turn to draw up boundaries in Europe. But all this arises from a strategic error by the Soviet government in the 1920s when they drew up their subsidiary republics. Their policy for regional autonomy was to create ethnically based subsidiary republics. And this eventually proved fatal, both because it allowed the local bureaucracies to cultivate nationalism as a basis for local support, and it meant they were able to manipulate this in the crisis of 1991 to pull their countries out of the Union. If you hadn't had a supposedly ethnic national basis to Ukraine, Belarus and Russia, the bureaucracies in these countries would not have been to, able to declare independence and then manufacture support for it afterwards. The problem is that Soviet theory on nationalism grossly underestimated the role of the state in creating nationalism. Nationalism is a state supporting ideology and one of the great things favouring it is the existence of a local state machine which is able to mobilise nationalist ideology. And when travelling around the southern USSR in the 80s, it was very evident to me that the local states were whipping up nationalism. Local state machines were whipping up nationalism. Now look at the distribution of the population of the USSR. Large areas in the east and north with very low population in yellow. The more green it is, the denser the population. So the dense population is here and down in the, the southwest. Just a couple of areas. Most of it is relatively empty. So how should, or I'm not saying how should, I'm saying how could they have divided it in a way which didn't foster nationalism? Well, we know that another great power, the main rival to the USSR, the USA, followed a quite different policy in creating its local government units, or local republics, which they call states. They just divided the land up on north, south, east, west lines. 
with straight line borders, except perhaps where there was a river. And a side effect of this was because these areas were low density, by dividing them up of roughly to roughly the same area, they ended up with states with roughly equal population. So at least among the states of the Midwest, none of them is overbearing. You couldn't do that in the USSR because of the vastly different population densities. If you divided it into states of equal population, equal area, you'd end up with a whole lot of states with almost no one living in them in Siberia. But suppose you divided it on the basis of population, as I show in this hypothetical map. You can take the population density map and work out what a group of states or constituent republics of the same population would be. This gives an example of suppose you divided the USSR in 1920s into eight states of 20 million. That's the sort of division you'd get. And these would all have had equal political weight and would have inhibited the rise of divisive nationalism and, that, and would, I think, have been a, a much better solution.